Here we are, friends. We're back for another interview. Uh, I'm so glad that you've enjoyed us uh, with this whole new series on watercolor. If you are interested in watercolor, you're at the right place because today I'm interviewing Emily Olson. How are you doing, Emily? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Gabriel. So Emily has a YouTube channel. She's got this humongous subscriber group of people. She hit 104 subscribers. <laughs> and I was like super stoked because I got to see an interview recently uh, with you and Steve Miller. And I loved watching that interview with you guys. Um, you also have a hundred or sorry, 413 videos and you have this platform here. And, and then I just recently saw you because people are always wondering like, how do I choose these people or why hasn't he chose me to interview me yet? Well, I bumped into Emily at the plain air convention where we were all in Denver, uh, just out painting and getting to see each other and giving fist bumps and hugs <laughs> and saying, yo, I haven't seen you in a while. So I finally meet Emily in person and I, right away I just was like, I've got to interview you. And she said, yes. And so Aww. here we are. And so Emily, there are just some super cool things that we want to know about you. And did you do art uh, growing up? Was it later in life? What did that art journey look like for mm. you? Art for me started really young. I've always drawn things and been drawn to drawing. <laughs> it's just something that's been a part of my life since I was really little. Um, I grew up with five other siblings and my mom homeschooled all of us, which was really cool because she was able to kind of see our unique, I guess, um, propensities and grow us in those directions. So she made sure we always had paper to draw. And I say we, because I have an identical twin sister who's also an artist. And the two of us kind of competed with each other all growing up and drew and painted. We even had um, summer jobs together that involved art. We worked at a magic show and we painted murals on the walls. So yeah, drawing and painting's always been a part. I did not study it professionally. I didn't go to an art school. I minored in art in college, but I was a music major. So I kind of did both for a long time, but art was on the back burner for most of my adult life. And I didn't really start to paint professionally until about five years ago. What was it five years ago that like just shifted you to really pursue that? Well, a couple of things. Uh, my twin sister, she pursued it professionally. She always knew she was going to be an artist. She always knew she was going to paint portraits. And I think my journey was a little messier than that. I didn't always know what I wanted. I taught piano for 10 years and was a flight attendant briefly. I've had a lot of random jobs and um, kind of just went where the wind took me. <laughs> but about five years ago, uh, my sister invited me to come to the Portrait Society of America convention with her. And that event changed my life. I saw all these passionate artists who were just loving what they did for their living. Um, but it, it definitely got me picking up my brushes again. And quite literally got me started in watercolor because my sister was a finalist that year in the competition, which is a really big deal. And she won a nice prize for that. And with some of her prize, she bought me my first set of watercolors. So it, she was the one who kind of gave, gave me the push in that direction. And when I started painting with watercolors, I played around with portraits. I did animals. I did a lot of different things. And I was a mom of very young children, but at the time they were really little. And I was trying to manage papering off my piano lessons and beginning art instead, because it just seemed to make more sense in that place where I was at in life. So um, the Portrait Society was what really what triggered the inspiration to get going. But then when I started painting more and more, I just fell in love with it. And, and fell, I fell in love with watercolor in particular. And I posted this little video, a little bear. I posted it on Pinterest and it got 200,000 reshares. Wow. So for me, that that triggered something in my head. And I thought, maybe I can make videos about this. So I started my YouTube channel and um, my husband, he was a sales, sales guy slash engineer. And he was really unhappy at his job. 
So about the same time that I started doing more YouTube, he quit his job. <laughs> and the two of us kind of worked on this together and create a whole, created a whole online school. And we started that in 2020. And as you know, lots of things happened in 2020, but for online businesses, that ended up being a really good time for us. And yeah, it just took off. So I'm really, really grateful for that progression of events because I think it all worked out really well for us and for our students too. So encouraging. And I know that's just going to give someone hope right now just to just dive right in, just like, you know, <laughs> head first, let's do this in 2020 events. <laughs> like, why not? And I think that's that fearless. It takes some of that. It just, I mean, you're brave and then you just went straight braver. And <laughs> that's something that it just, it's not just a artist, but there's a, a little bit of maybe entrepreneur uh, ship that's uh, a hungryness or uh, maybe a dream to work for yourself. Uh, was that a little bit of push for you and your husband? Oh, for sure. Yes. Um, my husband is, uh, he's an entrepreneur at home and he felt very stuck and pigeonholed in his engineer jobs. And with sales, I don't know if you know anything about sales. It's, um, it's just really hard working for a quota or trying to meet a quota, working for bonuses and commissions, especially when the company's not working for you. They're kind of working against you and raising your quotas and, um, they have a whole marketing team that wasn't doing its job. It was just a whole bunch of factors that were making him so unhappy. And um, so we had some resources to get us started. It's not like we went into this completely risking everything, um, but it was definitely really scary. That whole first year when you're building a business that may or may not work out and starting a YouTube channel with virtually no editing experience, <laughs> no experience in front of camera even, there's just a lot that could go wrong. And, you know, we just did the best that we could and great. I'm so grateful that it actually worked out, <laughs> but yeah, a lot of that was, there's a lot of sweat, a lot of tears, <laughs> but I definitely mean, that drive for, you know, building a business. Yeah. I just got a picture. Uh, I don't know. You might've saw it too, but you know, 2020, uh, we were all sitting around and Eric Rhodes decides to hop on Facebook live and uh, his easel, he's like, hi, I'm out painting. And his easel like blows over, <laughs> you know, and he's like, oh, well, and he just keeps rolling with it, you know, <laughs> and uh, I think some of that gave some of us hope too, if you had saw that, <laughs> uh, you're laughing. So I'm like, yeah, she saw it. And, so good. Uh, you know, there's something about just Punching record and doing. Yeah, you just got to be there. Just like, you know, I really enjoy I, I'm, I'm a secret fan of yours. Uh, oh. I've been watching some of your videos. I enjoy seeing the portraits and the animals. And I'm sure some people are watching this have probably algorithms kind of like, look at these uh, paintings. <laughs> and so I guess people are probably wondering, I mean, how do you know what to start with? Like, uh, you know, do you do a series of portraits or a series of animals? What did that look like for you and your experience? Mm. Well, when I was first starting with one colors, I started with portraits because that's what I knew. That's what my sister was doing. That's what I was inspired to do. And being a mom of toddlers, I wanted to paint my own kids. So uh, that's kind of just where the inspiration began. And I thoroughly enjoy painting people. It's the hardest, most challenging thing to paint, especially if you're going for the likeness. Uh, and then I started painting my friend's kids. And I had a whole series of toddlers making really funny expressions. I thought that was just super fun. Um, and I started getting a couple of commissions doing that. And then I realized that commissions were just not what I wanted to do. I, I really admire artists who can make a living doing that and enjoy doing commission work. But for me, it's just so much pressure because you're trying to make this mom or this grandmother or whoever's commissioned this portrait perfectly happy, which <laughs> not to mention portraits are just so challenging. There's a lot of emotion involved with it. Um, so I kind of switched over to painting animals. But again, it came from that uh, being a mom of kids sort of came out of love wanting to decorate their rooms. And my daughter's in love with puppies and dogs. She's obsessed with them. So I started an Etsy store 
And I thought, what if I painted every single puppy breed that I could possibly paint and sold prints of these? Because then I wouldn't have to you know, trade my time for money and paint something specifically for one person, but I could sell prints and then people could buy puppies that match. So that was the concept. And so I started painting more and more nursery art and just fell in love with painting animals. I, I don't think there's necessarily got to be a plan going into what you decide to paint or what order you create it in or what series you do. I think it needs to come from the inspiration in the moment in a lot of ways. Uh, and I think, um, I could definitely benefit from planning more and doing more, uh, I guess, series that are definitely more intentional that way. But starting out, there wasn't any kind of plan with that. But uh, every single painting is good practice and gets you going into the next project and can create inspiration for the next thing. So I'm a firm believer in just painting. Whatever strikes strikes you at the moment, just paint. Whatever will get you there. I like that, uh, you know, because you could you could just be sitting there going, "Well, do I do the Dalmatian or do I do the sheepdog <laughs> or do a wolf?" Like, no, just just pick one and just go. You know, get going to work. That sounds like you know a good place to start. Uh, starting with portraits, something that you're familiar with, you're kind of comfortable, and you're like, "This is a realm that I'm used to." And then all of a sudden you get some wins and you start yeah. getting some momentum. And that's what I'm hearing from you. Yeah. And that should give some people that have kids some hope because we, <laughs> uh, I also interviewed Angela Fair. Uh, we interviewed her and she talked about how she would run and video herself painting while the kids take a nap, you know? Yeah. And I've had a teenager and the teenager is like, dad, drop me off at the roller skate rink so <laughs> you can film a video and I won't bug you. And then I get feedback from the family, you know? And yeah. so uh, what is what does that look like for you? Like, um, as far as like materials, uh, what are you using? Are you using the same materials for your portraits uh, for and your things with your animals? What do you use as far as materials? Mm, that's something that's definitely developed over the years. I started out with just a kind of cheap set of watercolors and quickly abandoned those. And I also had no idea about paper when I first started. And I watched a lot of YouTube at the beginning to learn some of these basic things and quickly figured out cotton paper is the best. And, you know, when you play with a bunch of different brands, then you figure out what your favorite is. And that's just a process of trial and error, right? Um, so now I have a pretty standard set of 18 colors that I just use for everything. And it's a mix of Daniel Smith and Holbein. And I, I love my silver black velvet brushes. I don't deviate too much from that. A lot of Fabrian Artistico and Arsh paper, um, but I will still experiment a lot, especially for this channel. And that's been one of the most fun things ever is I get to just buy whatever stuff I want because I can make a review of it for my video. And unfortunately it ends up, you know, kind of stacked back here, but <laughs> I just get to play. I love my job. I get to play with all these supplies, play with paints. And, and that's really what's helped me develop um, more intentionality with the supplies that I use because I actually know what's out there, like them or not. It's, it's a process. You just have to kind of figure it out. But a lot of it does come from, yeah, deferring to the experts and saying, what do you use? That's where I started. I started by looking at Mary White's list of colors and saying, okay, I need all those, you know? So it's, it's really helpful when you have masters who are already out there that you don't have to reinvent the wheel, just do what they're doing to the best of your ability and give it a try that's so good and mary white is a good person to start <laughs> with and see what she uses because boom it's, oh my goodness right <laughs> just, she's an amazing artist and so i could see how having those like mentors speak into your life and the circle of people would help you grow and accelerate pretty fast yeah yes and speaking of kind of doing what other people are doing getting back to figuring out what's a paint um, if, I mean, this is advice for anyone who wants to start a channel or wants to figure out what is going to make an impact, I guess, in this realm. Um, I did a ton of searching on YouTube. What are people searching for? And I'm sure you've done this too, but when you figure out what's the most popular, that's a great place to start because if it's popular, people are going to love it. So I mean, choosing dog breeds, I didn't, I didn't really just choose random breeds. I chose the most popular pets. 
Labradors, Golden Retrievers, German Shepherds, you know, the most popular things. So it's always a good idea to see what's what's working for others and just do your own spin on it. I like that because, again, I just hear your excitement of doing some research and figuring out what people actually want. So you're not just like spinning your wheels and yeah. not going anywhere. These are actually things that people want to know about. And we need more people like you that actually care what people are looking for. And, mm. I, and I love that. I think people can really, uh, I love your transparency. Thank you so much for being just you. We need more people that can just be transparent and say, hey, I've been doing this for this amount of time. Because I think that gives them, again, hope where, hey, she's done it for this amount of time, as opposed to how do you compare yourself to someone that's been painting for 50, you know, 60 years. It's, <laughs> it seems really far. It doesn't mean it get very, you know. Yeah. So, and now here we are, fast forward. Work changed since 2020. Have you seen that significant shift and whatnot? Mm. I have. Yes. I, I don't think you can help but see a change when you're painting every single day. I think some days are definitely better than others. We all want to just be the inspired artists who just get to sit down and paint whenever we feel like it. But when it's your job, you do it every single day, rain or shine, regardless of how you feel. And I think that kind of discipline incorporated into my work has changed everything. And um, so I just feel a lot more with my materials, with my brushes, with the different techniques. And of course, you know, watercolor, it's, it's really unpredictable. It can be difficult. It can be frustrating. And uh, the more you, the more you do it though, the more you can completely predict what might happen. And it, maybe it won't go exactly like you thought, but you know how you can fix it or how you can modify it, or you just develop little strategies based on that experience of painting day in and day out. And of course, having lots of failed paintings. So um, I would say overall, my style hasn't changed a whole lot. I think it's kind of it finds you, your style will find you, but it's, it's definitely gotten more predictable. Yeah. I can predict the results a little bit better, but I'm also trying to paint harder things and things that I maybe never would have tried five years ago. And that's really fun when you get to that point. That's great. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, your process and how do you get started? Like, how, how uh, what is what does that look like for you? Do you grab a cup of coffee and head into <laughs> the studio? And okay, well, um, as a YouTube artist, I do have to think a lot about my channel and plan ahead for filming for that. I try to do two to three weeks ahead, and and. Lately, now that it's summer, I'm trying to paint outside a lot more and do more plein air videos. I try to do at least one um, product review, one plein air video, and then just kind of whatever else happens to occur to me <laughs> that month. Um, but so my setup looks different whether I'm outside or inside. And in my studio, I have all of my cameras set up just where I want them. I have a flat desk. And I do mix up what papers I use depending on the size of the piece or whatever I plan to paint. But like I said, I have a pretty set palette and I try to record everything I do because inevitably one of my students will ask if there's a tutorial. I almost, almost always have the camera rolling. Um, so that's what I do during the day. And my, just for me, painting is at night when my kids are either in bed or they get like an hour of tablet time so I can just kind of focus on what I want. So I'm working on a self-portrait back here, actually. It's kind of oh wow full sheet, but there's a lot of work still to be done on that. It's been sitting there for a while. For bigger paintings, I do work upright just because it's flat. I just can't see it correctly. And then outdoors, I work upright as well. But no, I don't, I don't usually drink coffee while I'm painting because you've probably had this issue with dipping your brush in the wrong jar. Yeah. I think we all have. Of course. <laughs> <So> no, <I don't. laughs> oh yeah. Sometimes I'll have a glass of rosé while I'm painting and that's, that's a nice treat. And I listen to audiobooks. That's the best. Oh, that's so cool. What, yeah. what kind of audiobooks do you like to listen to? Oh goodness. Uh, a lot of self-help, a lot of business, um, but a lot of autobiographies and memoirs, history, Goodness, it's 
big variety. <laughs> Sometimes I'll indulge in uh, fiction that feels like a leisurely indulgence. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's what I do while I'm painting. And how do you consider like the material? Do you ask yourself, is this something that I can teach so that uh, maybe uh, a beginner could paint? Oh, that's a yeah, that's that a really good like question. Mm -hmm. Um, so my online course, there are hundreds of videos on there now since 2020 when we started it. And when I first started out, I did not have that intentionality with it. I wasn't really sure. I didn't know what I was doing, let's be honest. So I would just kind of record and paint whatever I wanted and put it up there. But then I quickly realized that it was pretty advanced. There wasn't a structure for anyone who is a beginner. So early on, we created an entire beginner course. We call it 30 Days to Watercolor. And it was just a series of modules starting from talking about materials and brushes and paper and all that, and starting with basic things like water control, brush strokes, et cetera. And then at the end, you get to do like five fun little projects using all of those things that you've learned. So that's where we send all of our students who are beginners is to that course. And then um, we have something called daily challenges, which is five days a week. Now we're putting out 20 minute tutorials. And th those are definitely geared for any level, but somebody who's already watched the beginner course, if that makes sense. And so, yeah, I do definitely change highlight what I'm teaching and, and what I'm talking through depending on who it's targeted for. So if I'm doing a cloud tutorial for YouTube for beginners, I try to go way slower than I normally paint, which with watercolor, you do have to work fast with some things, but um, I just slow my whole pacing down and try to explain exactly everything, how it feels, how it looks, you know, so that it can be easily re replicated by a beginner. But if I'm painting something a little more advanced, I take that same style of teaching, but I'm applying it to more complicated things like overall uh, composition and edges and just more abstract things that beginners can't even try to think about. So yeah, definitely when I sit down and paint and record, I'm always thinking through who the audience is and what level they're at. That's very nice of you because there are some teachers out there that are just like, you either catch up or you just fall <laughs> on the wayside. And I I think a lot of people are willing to spend uh, a chunk of money to maybe paint mm -hmm. portraits or animals or landscape. And um, the other question I had for you um, was, what would you consider, What if I were to pigeonhole you, like, what would you consider yourself? I mean, it's not abstract and it's not... Uh, it's what would you call your style of watercolor? I would say it's semi-realistic. Uh, it's it's definitely not hyper-realistic, but I want there to be a center of focus that is realistic. So yeah, semi-realistic, I think. And and what are those like little sets of rules, you know, or principles that people need to understand to make your kind of work? Hmm. Well, yeah, I hate the word rules, especially as an artist. I, I think that's something that has held me back for many years, like follow this rule. Um, for my style of painting, I would say it's, I paint fairly dry, which means that there's an emphasis on water control and brush control. And so um, instead of using tons and tons of water and having puddles on my paper, I, I do tend to work in smaller sections. Well, that's not true. I start with big washes. So you do have to do, do a lot of wet and wet at the beginning to lay in blocks of color. Uh, and then I like to tighten it up gradually layer by layer. And so you're using both wet and wet and wet and dry when you're painting in this style, which is really fun. I think it's the best of both worlds. And I like those words. I like hearing about wet on wet, wet on dry. And you guys can go find more out about that but we'll put some links for emily in the show notes uh where you can learn about more wet and more dry stuff it's like could you talk about the passion part of being an artist yeah absolutely uh it's one thing to sit down in front of a camera and paint something to please someone else but that's not going to bring you the same joys when you're painting something for yourself or someone that you love and to me, those are my absolute favorite paintings are the ones I get to do just for me that I'm not recording. 
And so this self-portrait is one. It's where I get to play and explore and be okay with failure and maybe mess up in front of the camera when you, you know, there's limited time and you have to be productive and get a certain video out and get this thing done. There's a little bit of that fear of, I don't have time to mess this up. So I'm going to say, stay safe and just do what I know will work. Whereas when I'm painting my own kids or my husband or myself or a friend of mine, I, I can just kind of do however I want. And that's the best part. <laughs> It's I get to paint with passion. I get to listen to my books and I can just really zone in getting in the zone. Right. We've talked about creative flow before. I'm sure you've heard those terms many times, but that's when I'm in the flow is when I'm painting people I love. So, yeah, there's nothing like it. That's it's a great outlet. That's a great term, you know, finding the flow. Uh, you found a subject matter. You have uh, found all your art supplies you need. Uh, you've got your favorite podcast or audio book playing. Mm -hmm. And you've created these codes around you uh, where now, like, okay, I'm setting myself up to win. This is my shalom right here. <laughs> There's such a peace in this room. Yeah. And um, how does that feel like for you in during that process where, because uh, this is the shaky part, right? There's a part of watercolor where you're like, I don't know if this is going well. And uh, and you also, very nice of you to say that you make some bad paintings too. Oh, yeah. To right? <laughs> yeah, I don't show those very often. <laughs> and you should it because th that's, that's between you and that experience, right? Yes. <laughs> and um <laughs> But that's so cool that, um, you know, there is a time when to like uh, step up and be professional and I'm going to not try anything experimental right now, but I know how to paint this to mm -hmm. teach you yeah. and I can go do my other <laughs> you know, disasters <laughs> and, and great masterpieces and my own thing here. And so thank you for sharing those two separate things. Yeah. And so um, do you enter... Uh, like shows like competitions or anything like that yes I have in the past and um this one was actually in a show uh but it's this past year I haven't had any opportunity to do that I've been so busy adding daily challenges <laughs> those have been incredibly time consuming to my watercolor mastery course and you know just keeping up with my channel but that's definitely one of the goals for the future I think uh, it takes a lot of time and dedication to create something that's competition worthy. And it has to be your own source material. It needs to be the best work that you can put out. And um, that, yeah, that takes a lot of time. So haven't had a chance to do that lately, last year or this year, not too much, but that's a goal for futures for the future. That's great. And then there's one thing we haven't talked about on this show is silver brushes. We've talked a lot about Escoda and Daniel Smith. Oh. And that's probably because of my fault. But could you tell us a little bit about silver brush? Like, how did you oh. get introduced to silver brush? Well, um, actually, you, you, you know the channel Nakachino, right? She's one of the biggest watercolor channels on YouTube. That's her favorite brush. And I, I bought it probably, I think, on her recommendation when I was first starting out, just bought a size eight and it just comes to the nicest point. So the silver black velvet brushes are half synthetic bristle and half squirrel. And there's something about that combination to me that is just magical. It just has this perfect absorbency and springiness and it, I just love them. So those are probably my favorite brushes. I have them in a ton of different sizes, mostly round brushes, um, but I also have a, it's like a one inch flat, br flat wash brush and a I don't know. I have a whole bunch, but yeah, the round brushes, I just keep coming back to them again and again. It's what I recommend to my students too. When you're, when you're teaching a student about brushes, how do you get them to look past, you know, some people think if I buy this one brush, it's going to be the magic brush and it's going to pay <laughs> perfect. And I'll be just like Emily, yeah. like, oh, how do yeah. you get them past <laughs> that? Well, it's kind of a joke with us instructors. We're like, if you buy my set, then you'll be instantly amazing at, <laughs> but no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> I, I just tell them to log the brush miles. I know Angela Fair says that too. That's uh, it's so important to just 
practice and play all the time. And you can have the best materials in the world, but if you're not using them, they're not going to serve you and you're not going to get any better. So, uh, you know, the materials are really secondary to finding your passion and the time to do it and, and just making that happen. Just being motivated, sitting down and painting. Uh, what would you say to someone, they are an artist and they should be creating art, but just they're not doing it. Maybe uh, uh, something tragic's happened in their life. Uh, what would you say to that individual? That's the hardest Ooh. question at this interview. Yeah. Um, I actually know someone like that right now who is incredibly talented. He's an oil painter. He doesn't actually do watercolor, but um, he he's studied with some of the best artists in the world and has been in all these incredible shows and has sold paintings. And he just goes through these really rough seasons where well, he just had a breakup. You know, there's life events that will kind of knock you off your feet. And um, it's it's hard to encourage someone necessarily to take the time to paint because I think that's something they have to find out on their own. They have to go through the self-discovery and the hard process of looking themselves in the face and, and realizing, hey, do I, or asking themselves, hey, do I actually want to paint? Is this something I actually want to do? Um, so I, I'm not in the business of giving people advice and telling them, hey, you should be painting more. And I, I definitely encourage them to do it because of the joy that they can find in coming back to it. But I think one of the things that we have to do when we're in those moments of just wanting to wallow in whatever hard thing that we're going through is just ask ourselves, first of all, is this the person I want to be? And if it's not, what do I need to do to change that? And when it comes to your art, do I really love this? And if the answer is yes, then what's keeping me from doing it? And most of the time, it's our own fear of failure. We don't want to get out our supplies. It's been months or whatever. And we're afraid that it's going to just be a terrible painting. And maybe it will be because we hadn't practiced it in a long time. But you got to get past that little hump. I, I, when I play piano now, I still play piano once in a while, but it used to be my whole life. And when you don't practice for a really long time, you kind of lose a lot. You just forget your fingers get clumsy. And the same things happen. The same thing happens with painting. You can just sort of lose some of those intuitive things that you had when you were in the flow and when you were painting every day, but you can get it back. You definitely will get it back. Just got to start. <laughs> So yeah, just start. That's wonderful. I like that. It, it's a, uh, we've been hearing a similar theme for that one. You know, if you just organize your studio and get it ready, mm -hmm. get the, get the brushes and the paints ready and just start, set a, set a timer for 20 mm -hmm. minutes. That's mm -hmm. a great answer. That's concrete advice. Yeah. What would you say to someone that's, uh, starting to think they want to give a uh, watercolor a go? Oh, I would say watch YouTube, <laughs> get out books from the library, uh, but most importantly, just find some small watercolor papers and just play. Yeah, find a comfortable space. Like you said, I started at my kitchen table and it worked great. As long as you have some natural light and a brush and a set of paints and some cotton paper, you're going to have fun. Pick a picture that inspires you, maybe something not too hard. Or something from life, like an apple or a cherry tomato, something small. And draw really basic and just fill it in with paint. And you're going to have a blast. That's a wonderful answer. I think people uh, they take you up on those things. And I think one of the things I've noticed uh, when I sneak over to your channel and I watch what you're doing is I do love how you change it up. Uh, even the most recent one, and this will probably be outdated probably <laughs> five years, 10 years from now, but uh, you did this video on sketchbooks and you bought all the sketchbooks <laughs> you can get on Amazon that yeah. had a hundred percent watt collar. And I love how you've done that through. And then a couple other ones you shuffle in there, like you were saying, playing air or being right. in the studio. And I, I love how you change it up. 
And because we kind of do have some of our little favorite TV shows to watch, right? Yeah. We might be over here watching Star Wars. I can't. Next, we're over here watching some kind of reality show. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, I and and what have you? What have you noticed by changing that up? Well, for one, I don't get bored. <laughs> I think it's important for us creators to constantly challenge ourselves with new things. And so my channel is a wonderful creative outlet for me. It's just been the most fun I've had in years. And so changing it up for me is just a way to keep the freshness, the excitement about the art. And that's true for subject matter too. So if you're finding that you're just getting burned out on portraits, it's really good to just switch over to flowers for a minute or do a landscape or get outside and paint. I think artists in particular were kind of prone to just get bored pretty easily. So it's got to keep the excitement. And that's that's what it does for me. What has been one of the toughest things through this whole journey of being a influencer on YouTube? I I think the toughest thing has been keeping up with a rigid schedule because YouTube, they really favor consistency and posting regularly. Um it's it's been definitely a cause of some anxiety over the last couple of years. <laughs> and when I first started out, I was doing three videos a week, which was insane. Um, but at the same time, it's it's like you get to choose how how much content you put out, how long the videos are, how complicated they are. And so I'm learning how to adjust that based on what I need that week or that month. And so it's been amazing the process of self discovery but also really, really, really tricky. And you kind of look at yourself and have to learn what your weaknesses are. Another difficulty is just, I'm a people pleaser. I want to please everybody. And sometimes I'll get comments that that just rock me. (laughs) And um, my gut reaction is to want to just instantly put out a video to please that person or whatever. And I'm realizing I can't please everybody. I just have to remain true to myself. And yeah, that's a challenge. There's there's a lot of emotional stuff that goes along with being on camera and being, you know, having my whole life on just on the internet. <laughs> I mean, and thank you so much for sharing. That's so wonderful that, um, you know, it's not always, you know, the equipment <laughs> that is the issue, even no. though there's weird <laughs> updates and stuff that go on. Yeah. Uh, uh, but how has it been helpful to have your husband uh, be in your corner during this process? Oh, I couldn't have, couldn't have done it without him. He literally built my whole studio. And I wish I could show you, maybe I'll do a studio tour at some point, but this thing is, uh, it's robust. There's a whole <laughs> like metal rig above me with the lights and he set up all my cameras and he researched all the equipment. So I didn't have to do any of that. And I know for beginning YouTubers, that's one of the most scary things is figuring out what do I actually need? And um, he did that for me. So that saved me a lot of the headache. And it's also, he's an engineer, so he enjoys the technical aspect of these things. Um, and then he's also built my entire website and done all of that back end work to create my online school. So he's, he's just been awesome. Definitely the biggest support system I have. That's great. That's super good that you got, you know, a craftsman, a carpenter and such. Who does the editing of the videos? (laughs) Yours truly. (laughs) Oh yeah. That's great. And, you know, and, and how, how does that look like for you? I'm such a perfectionist with my editing. I even edit out breathing sometimes because I want it to just move. So I I probably need to be a little bit more relaxed about that because I'm up till 10 sometimes every night, you know, editing. But I will say we did finally hire an editor for my daily challenges for my courses online. And that's been a huge help. But I still do all my YouTube ones because they're really fun. I love the creativity. I love to be able to just go through the B-roll and figure out how it's going to tell a story. And um, But yeah, I probably am too much of a perfectionist with it. My kids will say so also. (laughs) That's so good. That's so good. So uh, what would be the first steps for someone signing up for your courses? Oh, well, um, first steps would be to download my free guide. I actually have two free guides you can get on my website. One is a pet portraits 
free guide all about how to choose colors for any pet. And that one is really robust. I think it's like 24 pages long and it's just a free ebook. So then you can get on my email list. And, and then I also have a free okay. watercolor jumpstart guide, which has really fun projects for beginners. I think you get to paint an apple and a tree and there's just brush stroke exercises and all kinds of things. And my husband helps me with that. We spend a lot of time just working them out, trying to make them as beautiful and as beginner friendly as possible. So that's where it would start. And you can go to watercolormastery.com and um, find out more about what we teach. Okay, and I'll put that down here in the show notes. And I'm going to have to have you back on here, Emily, because I have so many more questions. <laughs> Is there something that I haven't asked you that you would like to share with people that uh, have passion for watercolor? When I was first introduced to watercolor, I'd always been told watercolor is the hardest medium. Have you heard that before? That statement completely out of your head? Because I would say that just about any medium is hard if you decide that it is. And every single medium requires practice and play. And watercolor is no different. It's just, it's different techniques from other media, but they're really fun. So I would just encourage you to put that on your head and just go for it. <laughs> I love that. I love being an instructor that slashes lies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, my, my little I'll toss back to that, you know, if they're going to throw me that ball uh -huh. is I just throw right back to them. I say, hey, I'm a really bad baker. I burn stuff when I'm baking. But if I bake often, if I'm on cookie duty for Christmas time, uh, about the third batch turns out pretty good. Yes. And we'll take those to the party. <laughs> Exactly right. Yep. <laughs> and how did you how did you meet Steve? Uh, Steve Miller? Oh. And I've been seeing on social media guys been out painting. Uh, yeah. You know, how did you get to meet him? Well, um, so Steve Mitchell, he's kind of a staple on YouTube, right? He's been doing this for nine years, he says, almost 10. And I had just been followed, following him as soon as I started watercolor. I just went to YouTube and was looking up the most popular channels and and Steve is just such a good instructor. So I was always watching his videos and seeing how he teaches. And uh, I still have so much to learn from him. But he was so kind to just start commenting on my videos. And I would comment back. And it was just a, a back and forth over YouTube exchange. And then one random video, when he commented on my video, someone else uh, commented and said, you guys should do a collab. And... So we said, hey, OK, let's do it. So Steve signed me up. We did a Zoom interview just like we're doing now. And the rest is history. <laughs> I love that. I love that. But you guys didn't have Reese in there. Um, oh, <laughs> I'm well, kidding. I'm hey, kidding. we have a video coming out. Reese plays a big part in that. You'll see. <laughs> So good. That's so good. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for my pleasure. Uh, letting me interview. I'm going to have to have you come back because I probably have another gazillion questions for you. Sure. Uh, I think uh, we're going to have to do this again because I know people are going to just be enjoying this. And so thank you, everybody. Uh, if you've been here this long, you already know where to get a hold of Emily. It'll be down in the show notes. So thank you so much, every everybody. And thank you again, Emily. Thank you so much, Gabriel. So nice to talk to you today. All right, guys, keep those brushes wet and keep painting. Take care.